And uh, how many of you, if you had your choice, legally, uh, would rather not pay taxes? And uh, how many of you know somebody that you something in their cheating? <laughs> um, really good to be here. Thank you, Buck. Um, always good to be with Buck's crowd. Um, I know uh, a lot of you, and it's great to be with you. Thank you, all of you who, by the way, Buck's staff, can we give them a round of applause? We started doing events, and I know how hard this is now. <laughs> so I very much appreciate it. So uh, just a little bit of my background, for those of you who don't know me, I um, grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, got my Bachelor of uh, Arts and Accounting from the University of Utah, and then my Master's of Tax down the street here from the University of Texas. Any Texans in here? Have a so There we go. All right. <laughs> and then spent seven years with the uh, largest county from the world, what's now the largest county from the world, Ernst Young including three years in the National Tax Department, where I developed and, uh, courses for the CPAs around the country and taught those courses, uh, administered those courses. And then I spent uh, 14 years as an adjunct professor at the Arizona State University in their Master's of Tax program, and uh, spent four years as the in-house tax advisor for a Fortune 500 company in Phoenix. And for the last 25 years, I've been building um, CBA firms. And currently, what I do, uh, I really do two things. One is I do travel a lot with Mr. Kiyosaki around the world and uh, talk about taxes around the world. And amazingly, they're the same everywhere you go. So tax, it's, uh, it's amazing just how similar tax laws are. In Japan, by the way, where I'm headed with Robert next month, they actually have a retirement plan that they call a 401k. Okay, now that's actually the, 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 the internal revenue code section in our law that they call it a 401k because they copied it from the U.S. <laughs> so that's uh, fascinating. And um, the other thing I do is we have, uh, in fact, some of this I, I have to give Buck um, some attribution here because uh, Buck came to me a few years ago. He said, it's great what you're doing. He says, is there a way you can serve more people, right? And so what we've been doing the last year is we have developed a network of CPAs. We're already up to 20 um, uh, CPA firms in our network. Our goal is 10,000 worldwide. Um, and these are all small CPA firms because what we find in the CPA world is the A students start primarily in the big four county firms. Right, Ernst Young, Foley, et cetera. And then they end up in small accounting firms. The B students go to the big accounting firms that are not Ernst and they can't handle the small accounting firms. So they're pretty much our enemy. And uh, <laughs> yeah, because they're the B students, and who wants to be with a B student? They can be with an A student. So you guys are all A students, right? How many here are physicians, right? I mean, I know you're A students, right? So you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Robert always teases me. He tells me I'm a recovering A student because he's a C student. <laughs> C students are at least interesting. Um, B students are just boring. <laughs> so we've developed this network, and the idea is that we can serve more people, and we can serve at, at, at a really high level, and we've developed a system for reducing taxes. So we actually have the wealth building system for reducing taxes. Let me show you, um, I, I, I love Buck's presentation this morning uh, because he points out something, but I want to show you some numbers to what Buck was talking about, about how important taxes are from the standpoint of building wealth. So let's say that you had $10,000 and you invested that $10,000 over 30 years and you invested it at 10%. Not that you know, a lot of people are investing in 10%, but let's say you did. You invested 10% and you paid 40% tax. After 30 years, 40% on the 10%. Okay, let's be clear. 40% on the 10%. After 30 years, you would have roughly $60,000. Which is going 
Cool. That's great. Six times my return. That's not bad, right? If, on the other hand, you took that same ten thousand dollars and you invested it for thirty years and you invested it at ten percent and you paid zero percent. After thirty years you would have roughly one hundred and ninety-eight thousand dollars. So by show of hands, how many would prefer 198,000 to 60,000? <laughs> so this is why Buck makes a big deal out of taxes. Because if you have more money, it, you know, it's, it's about velocity. It's, it's about how fast can your money make money. And the challenge is, is that with taxes, if you're paying high taxes, it is practically impossible to reach your goal. It's, it, taxes suck too much out. How many think that should we have a change in the presidency next year that taxes will go down? <laughs> How many think it, they might go up significantly? So taxes, are, they're, they're not getting lower. This is the lowest they we're right now in one of the lowest tax situations we've ever been in, and yet they're still 40% plus. Okay, and so the chances of going lower are not good. The chances of going higher, very high. Um, it's interesting, Dave said he thinks interest rates are going lower. That's fascinating. Um, taxes aren't. <laughs> okay. Taxes aren't. But let me tell you that um, there's hope, and the hope is that once you understand, once we understand how the tax law works, okay, what's the context behind the tax law, then it completely changes the way, see my friend back there, so now, now she can see me, um, it completely changes the way you look at your at taxes and the, and the importance of your taxes, by the way, frankly. Um, as Dave, as uh, Buck said, if you're going to change well, as Buck said, I said, which is true. <laughs> uh, if you're going to change the tax, you have to change the facts. Um, what, what happens is that you, if you understand that the tax law is not really out there to get you, okay? The IRS is. But the tax law is not. The tax law is written by Congress, not by the IRS. IRS is the administrative arm. We actually have one of the best, uh, actually the best tax enforcement agencies in the world, um, the IRS. Um, we have more tax, better tax compliance than anybody else in the world, which is good for all of us, Okay? Um, but the tax law itself is written by Congress, and it's written for really two purposes. The first is the one we all understand. It's written to raise revenue. However, what most people don't recognize is that there's only really one line, uh, two maybe, two lines in the Internal Revenue Code of 6,000 pages that actually raises revenue. There's one, that, one line that says all income is taxable unless we say it isn't. And then there's another line that says no expense is deductible unless we say it is. And then there's some charts and tables that tell us how much tax to pay. The rest of the tax law is a series of incentives. <coughs> It's actually a roadmap to reducing your taxes. So once you understand the system and the, the, the process behind reducing and how the tax law works and reducing your taxes, then you can actually apply it to reduce your taxes every single day. How many would like to see their taxes go down every single day? That's what, that's frankly, what, what we're all about, wealthability. Um, actually, we came up with the name wealthability because to um, Buck's point, it's your ability to create wealth, not our ability. So our, our job is to help you increase your ability to create wealth and create your own wealth. And that's why, um, uh, that's actually what this book is about. So if um, you just want to know everything that I know, just read the book. How many have read, how many have read that book? Oh, thank you. I haven't read it yet. Raise your hand. Oh, there's a few customers out there. Oh. 
here's the so the first first concept to learn is that the cat has a series of incentives. Okay, then we have to learn where are the incentives. <coughs> right now, you're in the right place for incentives. In 1986, I was in Washington, D.C. in Ernst and Young's National Tax Department office. And the big winner, there were, there were winners and losers in 1986. Anybody know who the big loser was? Real estate. Real estate was the big loser. As a result, anybody remember 1989, 1990? You old enough to remember that? We had a major market crash in real estate as a, as a direct result of the 1986 tax act because that's when passive losses came in and I know y'all how many of you are physicians so you know about passive <laughs> losses don't you so which by the way we can solve we can solve that issue but I want to give you a, an explanation first of all of the premise of the tax law which is changed in 2017 from before 2017 before 2017, we really had what was a net income tax. Okay, so it was a tax on our income, and basically how it worked was we have income, expense, assets. Basically, if you took your money and you put it back in, and, and, and you put it, if you spend it, you got taxed, right? If you put it back in your business, you didn't get taxed, right? That's called a deduction. So you put it back in your business, it wasn't taxed. So you're taxed on the net income, net meaning gross income minus your expenses. What changed in 2017 is that you didn't have to just put it back into your business as an expense. If you took the money and you put it at an, into an asset, you also got to deduct it. So what we went from is we went from an income tax to a consumption tax in 2017. The fundamental change in the way the U.S. tax law functions. We've always been an income tax until 2017. We became a consumption tax country. Okay, we don't have a value added tax, but we do have a consumption tax because if we reinvest the money into an asset or into a, or as an exp a business expense, then it's not taxed. If we spend it, consume it, it is taxed. Now, here's an interesting consideration. If you save it, that's considered consumption. It is still taxed. <coughs> Savings are still taxed. Right? If you put it into a 401k, or a pension plan, it's still taxed. It's taxed later, but it's still taxed. Okay? So if you would, take one minute and explain what I just said to your neighbor, even if you have no idea what it was. Ready, go. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and wrap up. Turn to your neighbor, give him a high five, say you're smart. Oh, come on, you guys can do this, right? It's all you do is you look at the, your neighbor's elbow, look at their elbow, and do this, and I'm sure you can do it. Here, high five, there you go. All right, everybody, turn your neighbor, give them a high five, say you're smart. Give yourselves a round of applause, good job. Somehow we learn that when, we th when we're three, and we somehow forget it when we're 30. So... The reason why, by the way, the reason we do that is because energy requires, I mean, excuse me, learning requires energy. What does it require? Energy. What does learning require? Energy. Energy. So things we do when we do training, if you watch how Robert and I train, there's always something that requires energy, energy which includes high fives. All right? So that's why we do that. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about reinvesting your money, okay, 
Now, if you put it in your business, great. We all know about business deductions, right? Now, what you may not realize, um, not everybody realizes, <laughs> unless they're an employee, is that we used to get deductions in, as employees, and those all went away. Okay, investment deductions went away for employees. Um, any business deductions that related to your work, employee business expenses, those are no longer deductible. And by the way, some of the provisions in the law are temporary. The two things that are not temporary are the corporate tax rate and the elimination of, personal, uh, of employee business expenses. Those are permanent in, that, in this law. So they're not coming back as much as New York wants them to. So let me give you an example of how this works. And we're just going to use, I'm going to use real estate because that's where we are, it's real estate. It actually works with any productive asset, okay? So this, a stock is not a productive asset, is it? Okay, stock is a derivative. It's a derivative of the business. Now, if you invested directly in the business, you get the tax benefit. But if you buy a derivative of the business, in, order, in other words, stock, you don't get it. For example, if you invest directly in an oil well, you get this tax benefit. But if you invest in Exxon stock, you don't get the tax benefit because Exxon's getting the tax benefit. Okay, so it only goes one level down. So it's very important that you're investing directly. If you invest in the stock of a company that produced real estate, you would not get the deduction. The company would. If you invest directly in the real estate, like you do with Dave, Steele, then you get the benefit. So let's say that you invest a million dollars. You buy a million dollars, well, let's say you buy a million dollar property. It's not a very big property anymore. You buy a million dollar property, and if you buy a million dollar property, let's say that you put, make a down payment of $250,000. So $250,000 is down payment, and $750,000 is the debt. So little 75% loan to value, not, uh, not atypical in the apartment building business, for example. Uh, somewhere between 65 and 75% is where you're gonna get your leverage. Now, here's what's cool about this. Bank, the bank doesn't get any of the tax benefit. The investor does. Even though the bank's taking three-fourths of the risk, and the investor is taking one quarter of the risk, the investor gets 100% of the tax benefits. On a million dollars, with today's bonus depreciation, the tax deduction in the first year should be somewhere around $300,000. Somewhere between $250,000 to $300,000. Now, your investment in this building was how much? And your tax deduction is? So how many think that it's pretty cool to get a tax deduction of more than the money you put in? So at a minimum, it should be $250,000. Now, a couple of things have to happen. Let me explain how this happens. So you understand a little bit of what's behind it all. When you buy a piece of property, you purchase really four class, classes of items. You purchase the land, and land wears out when? Never. never. So you're, you're gonna depreciate it, never. So you get no depreciation on that. You buy a building. Buildings wear out eventually, and typically they're going to be depreciated in the apartment building business, sorry, over 27 and a half years. You also buy land improvements, such as landscaping. 
driveways, sidewalks, playgrounds, um, anything covered parking, outdoor lighting, fencing, all of that, land improvements. Okay, that historically is deducted over 15 years. And then you also buy the contents of the building. So if you looked in here, the lighting, the window coverings, um, if you have ceiling fans, the carpet, that's all contents, okay? What we'd call contents. And that historically was deducted over five years. Now, to do this, you have to do what's called a Cost segregation, what's it called? Cost segregation. cost segregation, okay? So you hire an engineer and an accountant to go and do a cost segregation. So when you're investing in an apartment complex, one of the things you wanna make sure of is that they do a cost segregation. And here's why. First of all, if you don't do it, then it's all gonna be allocated between land and building. Okay, so it's gonna be slow. But here's what happened in 2017. Land improvements and contents are now deducted in one year. They're deducted the very first year. And typically, somewhere between 25 and 30% of the purchase price of a building is going to be contents and land improvements which is where the $300,000 number comes from, it's 30%. Now that's typical, but you have to do a cost segregation. So take one minute and explain cost segregations and bonus depreciations to your neighbor, because now you're an expert. Go. <laughs> Folks, I know you're smart people. Turn to your neighbor, give my five, say you're smart. And give yourselves a round of applause, good job. Now, some of you are saying, oh, but I'm a passive investor, and the passive investment just raises its ugly head. Because you've been, how many of you have been told that if you have a passive loss, you get, don't get to deduct that against your other income? Raise your hand. Okay. Well, let me tell you the challenge with that statement. Passive losses are absolutely deductible. Currently, it's just that passive loss, what we call a PAL, passive activity loss, can only be deducted against passive income. Which we call a pig. So we say pigs are our pals. That's a passive income generator. And you're thinking, wait a minute, I don't have any passive income. So actually not knowing he was going to be here, one of my, one of my good friends and client, Tim Ham, Dr. Tim Hamby is here. And Tim, would, would you come up for a second? Give Tim a round of applause. <laughs> so Tim, you had this issue, right? You had the passive loss issue, right? Yeah, big one. So uh, what do we do about it? So we converted my, what was active income into passive income, and basically my taxes dropped. I mean, it was life altering for me. So um, my surgery center, which I know a lot of physicians probably have that, essentially was a management agreement, which was previously being taxed by my other accountant as active income. And we figured out how to make it passive. be treated as passive income. So it's a matter of, give Tim a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you. So it's just a matter of identifying, and then we made a few changes so that we converted active income to passive income. For most of you, sometimes that has to do with the nature of your activity in the business, but like for Tim, it's just a matter of who owns it. 
So sometimes it's a matter of who owns the activity and how that activity is owned. And sometimes you might have passive income that you just don't recognize. And that's one of the things we found with Tim is that he actually had a passive activity that he, his accountant thought was active. But in fact, when we did the analysis of it, we got into the details of it. It was passive. It was passive. And so now Tim gets to use his passive losses because you're still a passive investor, right? Right, right. Yeah. So he didn't become a real estate professional. He's still 110% in I tried. You tried medical. to get Teresa back. <laughs> <laughs> my wife, my wife's a nurse, and she didn't want to do it. Yeah. We, we, we tried. Yeah. We tried. But Tim, Tim's wife goes, uh-uh, uh-uh. Yeah. I have children. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so we don't do that. Yeah. But we were successful still, oh, right? just life-altering. Awesome. So, so best I, investment I, I made was investing in Tom. So thank you. <laughs> Give Tim a round of applause. Thanks, Tim. So see, the key is, and and I'm going to actually conclude with this because I actually have another presentation I'm doing um, north of here in about an, 45 minutes. So <laughs> the key here is that. The difference was with Tim, you all recognize that it, it wasn't a matter of that he didn't have passive income, it's that he didn't recognize he had passive income. And, and, it, wasn't, and it was a matter of, is there something we can do to convert or change your active income to your passive income? Because everybody always tells me, well, you know, I know that you have to be a real estate professional, but what if you can't? My wife and I, we both run businesses. We are never going to be real estate professionals. We are never going to qualify for that designation. If you do, that's your get out of jail free card, right? I mean, it's all of a sudden, the, it's no longer a passive loss. Now it's an active, an active loss and it can offset any kind of income, even wages, right? So we're never going to do that. That doesn't mean that we're not going to be able to take our passive losses. It just means that we have to find and, and, and create passive income out of our already active income, and sometimes just uh, that's a matter of who owns, who owns it, the ownership structure. So part of our process at WealthAbility, when we take people through a process, and it is a process, the very first thing we'll look at is, is how do you own your investments and how do you own your business? Because that has, as Tim said, that has a huge impact on when you can take those losses. How many would rather take their losses today? Raise your hand. Okay, it's great that you get to carry them over forever and ever, okay, until the property sells, but like, Dave doesn't want to sell the property, do you? You want to keep them and keep producing income, and so if those passive losses are stuck there, you're never going to, you're going to get them 30 years down the road. That doesn't help you a lot. From a tax standpoint, it keeps your income from being taxed from the, from the um, property, but it doesn't help the rest of your income, right? It doesn't take that loss. I mean, think if you had $300,000 loss and you're in a 40% tax bracket, that's $120,000 and what could you do with that? You could reinvest it, couldn't you? That's called velocity, right? You reinvest the tax benefit and then if you reinvested that $100,000, that $120,000, what would that produce? Another tax loss, which you could also reinvest. But guess what? If you plan it ahead of time, you can do all of the, you, you can just take the money now, reinvest it the whole year. You don't have to wait until you actually make those new investments, knowing that you have a plan of action to make those investments. So you don't have to think about that one, I get, okay? But here's what I'm going to leave you with. The number one person, who, the person who's going to have the most impact in your life on your financial situation other than you is who? Your spouse, okay? Absolutely, your spouse. Number two is going to be your tax advisor. Because your number, <laughs> somebody say because your second biggest expense is taxes. I say it's your first big, ex biggest expense, okay, is taxes. And so if you can reduce your taxes and you can actually, by the way, it's, the name of the book is not tax reduced wealth, is it? 
it's tax-free wealth. And I, we have a number of clients that they are tax-free and they make a lot of money, okay? And because what happens is, is when you go through the process, now, I will tell you, and here's a caveat, you come to one of my members and you come directly to them, they don't, they can't, they, they can't give you the process, okay? Because the process includes education and the education is, is proprietary to us. So we actually teach them and walk them through the process to reducing taxes. And it is a process, isn't it, Buck? Isn't it, Tim? Did we go through a process, Tim? How long? Like five, six months, right? It took us, yeah, it took us to go through that process. But when you go through the process and, you, you, it's, a, and it's a step by step process, how many understand processes? Right? I suspect, how many of you are surgeons, for example? Okay, is there a process to surgery? Yeah, I mean, you do things in order, don't you? Okay, and you don't, you don't violate that order because if you do, something goes wrong. It's, it's a bad consequence. The same thing is true in tax law. If you don't follow the order, if you don't go through the process, the challenge is most, unfortunately, most of my profession doesn't understand the process. So we take them through the process. We actually, that's why, we, that's why we're so passionate about building our network. So I would ask, first of all, if you have a CPA that you love and you'd like them to learn the process, send them to us, okay? We would like to teach them the process. And where, we, where you go is WealthAbility. Dot com. That's where you can go. Send, send, the CPA, send your CPA friends for that process. Now, if you say, I don't think my CPA can learn that, then we actually have a, I've got to find it here. You can actually, you can yourself get a, a consultation, and I'm going to tell you where to go right here. We have a special place for you guys to go, and you text WFE2019 to... Four eight zero four seven zero four one eight zero, and if you text that, then you can get. Or I would give you a shortcut. Brad, stand up. Brad Doran is our director of client relations, and he's going to be here all all day, right? So. Um, Buck asked Brad to come, and so Brad's going to be out here. So if you have any questions about the process, any questions about uh, how your CPA can in, engage with us or how you would like to engage with us, please um, take time with Brad. He's happy to talk to you. Unfortunately, I can't. Did you? Question. Since the law changed in, in 2017, have you had any of your clients audited yet for the new changes? And did it We're not. It's way, way too early to have an audit. Um, here's what's going to happen. Well, here, now, that's an interesting question, and, and then I do have to wrap up. Um, so how you prepare your tax return has a huge impact on A, if you're audited, and B, what happens when you're audited. When, when our members, um, and my firm is one of our members, my, my own CPA firm, so Tim is, and Buck, they're my personal clients. Um, I, don't take very many of those. Um, when, when we prepare a tax return, we do it in such a way, we assume it's going to be audited. I mean, we, I haven't hand, handled an audit in years. But we do prepare as if it were going to be audited, meaning that we've got all the documentation, we've got all the law, we know exactly what's going to happen, and so we don't have to worry about that. Now, I would tell you, there are tax preparers out there who don't even retain your documentation. And a lot of them. Um, I think that's malpractice, but I'm not in charge of them. Okay, I'm only in charge of my members. My members retain documentation. So we, we don't, but this law, this new law, to your point, is very complex. So much so um, 
that we're actually doing a three-day training for CPAs in November to teach them how to apply the law because there's a lot of training out there on how to comply with the law, but there's no training out there for CPAs on how to apply it to actually reduce people's taxes. And that's what we do, is our, our specialty is, re, is, is tax reduction. So um, that's a really good point. There are gonna be audits. The, it's an extraordinarily complex area. I mean, some of you are familiar with this 20% deduction, which most of you don't, um, don't get, but some of you should because you actually have aspects of your medical practice that are probably not medical services and probably do qualify for that 20%. So there's all sorts of things. Um, the tax law, how many recognize the tax law is a little complex in its details? Raise your hand. It's very simple in its context. It's a series of incentives. And if you have a tax advisor who can handle the details, it's that combination that's gonna reduce your taxes. Thank you very much. Thanks.